But even at one, if you would get your little red hymn books and turn to page 150. Page 150. <laughs>
we've all been revived. And I say I have been revived. And the Bible will carry on in our heart. Now let me, uh, those of you that might be busy with us that's not affiliated, not going to church on a regular basis, let me invite you to, to uh, come to so Amen. It's still at 10, preaching at 11 o'clock on Sunday night. Our discipleship training is by Brother Ellie. It's a teacher there. And then on Sunday night uh, is our worship service. Boy, I tell you, we've been here some good preaching. Amen. 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 This guy has served us a steak every night. Amen. Amen. Y'all no, don't get too used to it. We're back to cheese and crackers. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's good to see y'all. Right? Years ago, we had this older guy that came down from the north to get the revivals for us. He'd always say, Well, the great going back to Ohio, back to cheese and crackers. I thought he was just bragging on the women folks cooking. But I went up and did a week revival for We Guess what? We had other than breakfast. Cheese and breakfast. <laughs> we had every kind of cheese you could ever make. <laughs> anyway, it is good. I'm glad y'all are here tonight. I'm telling you, I'll tell you, the Lord's going, the Lord's going to bless us tonight. There ain't no doubt about it. Now, we're going to take a love offering if we sing this uh, next song. I'm, I hope you will. Know, I'm gracious. I think it's been good enough to his wife uh, to be with us this week. Oh, I sure appreciate you coming. I appreciate those amen. I, I don't know what I'm about. That's that one. All right. All right, brother. Face one six.
this afternoon. Can I say it? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. You never know how it's going to turn out. I don't do this often, but y'all seem to put up my piano play every day. You give me three lips. No. It may not. No. Does all want like you preaching? <laughs> I got it open, brother. You got it open back there? Are we good? You're good. I like this song. I look like the
to Mark chapter 2, verse number 1. And I'm hot, so I'm going to take off my jacket. Y'all alright with that? Mark chapter 2. We're going to begin reading at verse number 1. I want you to think with me tonight about breaking through. And that is, it is a picture of revival. We're going to see here that there were men that were willing to tear off the roof to get to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm just convinced that we need a breakthrough. And that is to not only break through the roof, but to break through the walls and to break through the crowd and break through whatever it is that stands between us and the Lord. Amen. But I'm also convinced of this. I really believe that most churches don't have revival because they don't want to. Revival means work. Revival means God is cleaning me up. Revival means God is sending me on a mission. Revival is right and it's for us who are believers. And God is reviving us and God is stirring us. And God is awakening us. And man, if I get revived, it means that I know that I'm going to begin living for God. I'm just convinced most folks don't really want revival. We say we do. We have the meetings. We invite the preacher. But most churches are not revived. Because revival means something has changed. Amen. Breakthrough. I want one. Anybody else? Amen. I'd love to just be in one Holy Ghost revival meeting before I die. One! Where God pours out His Spirit in such a way that we don't know what to do with it. And maybe like on the day of Pentecost, they think we're drunk with new wine. But we're just filled with the Spirit. I better read. Mark 2, verse 1. And again, he entered Capernaum. After some days, it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive him, not even near the door. Isn't that great? And he preached the Word to them. What word is he preaching? He would be preaching the prophets of old. He would be preaching the kingdom of God. He would be preaching the very things that were written about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's preaching the word of God to them. And then they came bringing a paralytic. He was carried by four men. And when they could not come unto him because of the crowd, they, under, they uncovered the roof where he was. And so when they had broken through, there it is. We need a breakthrough tonight. When they had broken through, how is it that we're going to break through? I think we can break through in worship. I think we can break through in prayer. And I believe God that through the preaching of the Word we can break through. But it is a desire to know God. It is a desire to get where God is. They broke through. And they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Look at this. When Jesus saw their faith. When Jesus saw their faith. He said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. That is the miracle that happened long before the paralytic is raised up. Long before He met the need of the paralysis, He saves him from his sins. He realizes there's a desire in this man to be made whole and to be made right with God. Surely there's more to the conversation here. But the greatest miracle is salvation from your sin. And then God is going to raise him up. And some of the scribes were sitting there and they reasoned in their hearts. Notice that. They didn't do it out loud. They didn't say a word. But they're critical in their spirit. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? They're reasoning. Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately, when Jesus perceived in His Spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, He said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. And then he said to the paralytic, I say to you, take up your bed and walk and go to your house. I like that. Rise, take up your bed and go to the house. Immediately, he arose and took up his bed and went out in the presence of them all. 
so that they were all amazed and glorified God. And I like this last line they said. We've never seen anything like this. I would love to be in a meeting where we've never seen anything like this. Where we can leave and we knew that the power of God fell. That God spoke through His Word. That lives were changed. That those who were set lost were saved. And that those who were calmed in their spirit were revived. Oh, if we can leave tonight knowing we've never seen anything like that. And what we've seen is the presence of God. What we have seen is the power of God. I'm telling you, church, we need a breakthrough. I preach in a different church every week, and I'm telling you, churches everywhere need revival. Churches everywhere need a stirring. There needs to be a moving of the Spirit of God. We need the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. How we need a breakthrough. But does anybody really want it? And my goodness, it's one thing to say amen to that. But am I willing to do what is necessary that I might be revived? Am I willing to break through my pride? Am I willing to break through my rebellious ways? Am I willing to break through my disobedient attitude? Am I willing to do whatever it takes to break through into the presence of God? Here's the problems. We won't. We can't. And not now. We won't. That's a pride problem. We talked about that the other night. Most people have a pride problem. And those that won't admit that they have a problem with pride, have a problem with pride. The reality is we won't. I'm not going to allow God to work in my life. I'm just convinced today that many of us have already made up our minds that we are not going to change. That we are not going to let go of that sin. I prayed with so many people that would say, I know I need to be right with God, but I'm not ready. I know that I need to get saved, but I'm not ready. Not now. And what is it that they're not ready to do? And for the sad thing is, they're not ready to turn their back on their sin. Not now. No. Not now. We won't. And then there's the we can't cry. We never have, so we never will. The situation is hopeless. The church is dead. We'll never be revived. We'll never see glory days again. We'll never see the house packed again. Not only we won't, but we can't. The attitude that the best days are in the past. The attitude that what God did back then, He'll never do again. The attitude that the revival that grandmother and granddaddy knew about, that we will never know anything about. My friend, I'm here to tell you tonight that the Holy Spirit has not changed. God not changed. And the same Spirit that revived Grandma and Grandpa can revive us. The same Spirit that saved 40 and 50 and 60 people in a revival meeting can still do it. God is not at fault. He's still speaking. We just don't want to hear it. He's still saving. We just don't want to be saved. He's still reviving. We just don't want to be revived. Jackie, he's still calling people to preach. We just don't answer. God's still at work. Don't fault God. People say, man, why isn't God moving like He used to? He still is. God's Word is still sharp and quick and powerful. His Spirit is still convicting. God still works. The sad reality is we're just not interested in what He's doing. Amen. 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 I was reading today how that the church has turned from the Word of God and discipleship of the Great Commission to a, 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 a culture of entertainment in the church. And if it doesn't make us feel good, we don't want to hear it. And that's where we are today. Don't preach those kind of sermons. They offend us. I'm telling you we need to be offended. I'm telling you we need to be cut down. The reality is we need the Word of God that is sharp and quick and powerful. We need the Word of God to work us over. We need the Word of God to stir us within. We need a breakthrough. They did whatever was necessary to get into the presence of the Lord. Amen. 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 Are you listening? Amen. Listen to this. A mother camel and a baby camel were having a conversation. Y'all listening? The baby camel said to the mother, Mama, 
Why do we have such big feet? And the leather camel said, Well, you need to understand we've got big feet so that we can travel through the desert sands and not get bogged down. The baby camel said, Mama, why do we have such long eyelashes? And the mother camel said to the baby, It's because when we're traveling in the desert, it enables us to see without the sand blowing in our eyes. The baby camel asked a third question, Mama, why do we have this big hump on our back? Mama said to the baby, It's because when we're traveling through the desert, it enables us to travel for many miles. We can go for hours without water and food. The baby camel said, Mama, I got one more question. What are we doing in a zoo? <laughs> There's no sand inside. Here's an animal <coughs> that was made for sand. Feet, eyes, hump. There's a real possibility with this story that that baby was born in a concrete cell, so to speak, and raised in an environment where their feet never touched sand. Have you ever felt like a camel in a zoo? And you thought, surely, there's got to be more to this life. Yeah. Have you ever wanted to just break out and experience what God has for you? See, that in His own way, that baby camel was saying, I want out. I want to experience the sand. I want it to blow in my face. I want to walk on it as hot as it is. I want to do what I was intended to do. What is it that God has called you to do? Where is it that God has sent you? Where is it that He's sending you now? What is it that God wants to do in and through you? Amen? Amen. Amen. Sometimes I feel like a camel in a zoo. Man, I want to break out. I want to know the experience of God. I want to know the experience of trusting Him and walking with Him. But here they are. This passage in the Bible. They're all gathered around to hear the Lord Jesus, but there's no room for anybody to get in and so they break through. What does it mean for us to break through? The first thing that I notice is they had to break through the crowd. Now every story you read in the Gospels, the crowd is never kind to those who are trying to get to Jesus. You are always pushed back. You're unwanted. The crowd is never kind to the Christian. And it's still true today. If you want to get to Jesus, you may very well have to fight through the crowd. It's nothing short of a miracle. Four men are carrying a paralytic. It's as if he's a dead man. He has no ability to walk. He's, he's if you will, just a, a, a corpse, if you will. He has no life about him. And there they are working their way through the crowd. It is an absolute miracle that they were able to get through and to get to Jesus. If you want to get to Jesus, I'm just going to tell you right now, it may not be easy. You've got to fight through the crowd of critics. You've got to fight through the crowd of criticism. You've got to fight through the crowd that doesn't believe like you do. You've got to fight through the crowd of naysayers. You've got to fight through the crowd of those who reject you and reject what you believe. You've got to fight through the crowd of those that have rejected the Word of God. The crowd has never been kind to Christians. Amen? Amen. And you've got to deal with a family that I have found out is in every church. <clears throat> now, I don't know that this family is in this church, but I bet it is. I bet this family is a member of this church. They may not have been here this week, but I guarantee you every church has the Tater family on roll. Yeah. Adjunct taters. <laughs> well, don't look around. I don't want to know who it is. All right. <laughs> Spec taters. Oh yes. Era taters. Dick taters. And there's always common taters. 
in every church. If you try to get to Jesus, agitator will stand in your way. If you try to do what God's called you to do, spectators will not move. If you try to go where God wants you to go, you'll be affected by irritators. They'll just irritate you. If you try to do what God's told you to do, a dictator will stand in the way. He'll tell you that you'll never make it. He'll remind you of your past. He'll preach down to you. He won't give you any hope. If you try to get to Jesus, you'll have to work your way through the commentators. It's there. And I'm telling you, there's a crowd today that wants us to quit. I want to encourage you tonight, don't quit! Amen. Whatever it is God has told you to do, don't quit! Keep on preaching, Jackie. Keep on preaching. Keep on teaching. Keep on singing. We the grow. Don't stop! Amen. I'm telling you, we're living in a day and age. If the devil has his way, he'll shut down every church. Amen. Don't quit. The woods are absolutely filled with preachers that used to preach. Yeah, that's right. It's like, I guarantee it's right. I know about as many preachers that used to preach as I do that still do. Full of singers who used to sing. People who used to teach. Full of people who used to go to church. What is up with that? I used to go. I used to sing. I used to preach. I used to teach. I used to walk with God. I tell you what happened. The crowd has had an influence on us. And we gave up. The way is not easy. It is a narrow way. And few there be that find it. I'm telling you, breaking through is not easy. You've got to work on it every day. You've got to seek God every day. You've got to pursue God every day. You've got to read the Word and pray every day. You've got to walk with God every day. Don't you ever believe the lie that Christianity is easy. And yet, there's a really big push every December to put Christ back in Christmas. But what I would love to see is Christ back in Christian. I'm just convinced we've removed it. We can do it without it. We're smart enough. We know enough. We're old enough. We need Him. I guarantee you till our dying day, we need Him. Amen. Oh God, give us a breakthrough. God, revive us tonight. God, stir us. God, awaken us. We've tried it all and failed. And we need You. They broke through. They broke through the crowd and then they broke through the roof. Jesus saw their faith. Everybody else saw the hole in the roof. You guarantee old dictator saw the hole in the roof. <laughs> Everybody else saw man, what a mess. Jesus saw their faith. Everybody else thought, man, who's going to fix that hole? Jesus saw their faith. When you make a mess for the glory of God, God will see your faith. Amen. The world will see that you're making a mess. The world will see that you're stirring a pot. The world will see that you are behind the times and that your faith is irrelevant. God will see your faith. <clears throat> Jesus saw their faith. Everybody else saw the hole in the roof. And they broke through the roof for one reason. To get to Jesus. If you finally get to Him, <coughs> you will be criticized for tearing up the roof. I'm just telling you right now. Amen. Whatever it is that you're doing for the glory of God, however it is that you're living that brings honor to Him, whatever stand you are taking, whatever direction you are going in for the glory of God, Whatever change you are making in your family, whatever change in your life, there will always be somebody that's critical of you. There will always be somebody that will try to push you back. There will always be somebody to try to hold you down. There will always be somebody that tells you you can't. And you won't. And you shouldn't. You better keep on keeping on. Has God told you to stop? 
How y'all do it? Yes. Has God told you to stop? Then you better not stop. But if God tells you to quit, you need to quit right then. What has God told you to do? What is it that God has sent you to do? They broke through the roof and they broke through the crowd. And then I want to make a suggestion that you can't see. They broke through the walls. You say, well, I don't see that happening. I bet if you look a little closer, you will. These are invisible walls. They're there. And they're breaking through them. These are walls of fear and doubt and worry. Fear and doubt and worry. Does anybody battle with that besides me? Fear and doubt and worry. If the devil is going to attack me with anything, he attacks me with those three things. Fear, doubt, and worry. Fear, what's going to happen? Doubt, will God really do that? Worry, what is going to happen in a fear, doubt, and worry? And I want to tell you, those invisible walls were there that day. And they're still here today. Let me show you where they're built. Right about here. Now you can't see them. But I'm telling you, in every church, there's walls right here. And they keep us from coming to the altar. Fear and worry and doubt. What is everybody else going to think? What are people going to say? What if this and what if that? And how is this and how is that? And fear and doubt and worry. They're in every church. I'm telling you, Brother R.C., I preach in churches every week. And the altars are always empty. What a sad, sad sign of the time. Amen. How y'all doing out there? I've been needing to call for about five minutes. Y'all right? And I may need to do it again, but right now we're good. Invisible walls. They go all the way to the room. And we're back here. And we know that we need to go. We know that we need to pray. We know that we need to repent. We know that we need to get saved. But there's a wall here. And we just can't break through the wall. The only way you'll break through it is with the power of God. Determined. I'm going to pray. Determined. I'm going to repent. Determined. I'm going to be saved. Determined. I'm going to know God. Determined. I'm going to do what God is telling me to do. Amen. Anybody ever told you breaking through is easy? Hey, why? It's every day. The people that I have met over the years that have walked with God for 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, absolutely they are marked by the grace of God. But I have found another quality. I call it grit. And I'm talking memo. Memo in her 70s and 80s and 90s, she's got grit. She's willing to be faithful to God regardless. She's not going to give up her faith. An old godly man in his 80s and now in his 90s, he's believing God. He is marked by the grace of God. But there's also a grit and a determination that I will not give up. I will not let go. I will not turn back. I will believe God. Amen. Amen. Some of the most determined people I have ever met were dying with cancer. They not only knew the grace of God, there was some grit about them. I ain't going to let cancer steal my joy. I'm not going to let cancer steal my peace. I know the Lord and I'm going to walk with God. I have walked with Him here and I'm going to walk with Him there. They have a determination that most of us in this room tonight know nothing about because they know that death is not far away. They know that the devil is real, but they also know God and they realize they're about to break through into the presence of God. They've got some grit about Amen. 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 We're just too wimpy. And I'm not saying we need another Great Depression. But we need to be shaken. And I'm just convinced that we have it too easy. And we need something that causes us to depend on God. Amen, Cancer will do that. 
Are you with me? Y'all know more about that than I do, some of you. It'll cause you to depend on God. It'll cause you to cry out to God. Because you realize no one can do anything for me. It is God or it is not God. And so they believed in God. They had a friend that was dying. And each man had a corner of the cot. And they're carrying a lifeless man to the Lord. And somehow they climb up on the roof. And somehow they tear it off and they let the bed down. Oh, what grace! But my Lord, what grit! You will not stand in our way. We will get to Jesus somehow. I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. I am not turning back. Amen? Amen. Are y'all with me out there? Amen. Because right now, I'm not just preaching. I'm telling you my convictions. You've got to dig your heels in. Because somebody will try to kick you out of what you're doing. Somebody will try to push you back and push you out. Somebody will try to shut you up. You do what God told you to do. Dig your heels into the glory of God. Amen. Well, I don't know why I thought about it, but I thought about Polycarp. Have you ever preached about yeah. Polycarp? Yeah. yeah. Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna, one of those churches we read about in the book of Revelation. And he would not shut up. And he would not stop preaching the gospel. And when he was in his 80s, I believe he was 86 years of age, and he was about to be burned at the stake. He was about to be burned alive because he would not stop preaching the faith. And so they tied him to the post. They were going to burn him at the stake. They gave him an opportunity to renounce God. They gave him an opportunity to curse God. If you renounce Him, if you curse Him, we'll let you go. He's 86 years old. And he said, Come on, brother. 86 years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How now can I deny the king who saved me? 86 years old. You know what he knew? He knew he was about to step out into the presence of God. He knew that they were about to kill him, but they couldn't take his life. He knew that they were about to kill him, but they couldn't take his joy. He knew they were about to kill him, but they would never take away his song. Amen. There's just some things the devil can't get. Amen. Now here's the rest of that story. I don't know if it's true or not. They say that when they lit the flame at his feet, that the flame leaked out around his body. He wouldn't burn. It's like God was taken care of. And so they speared him right through the heart. They killed him on the spot. And then burnt him themselves. What a sad story. My goodness. An 86-year-old man. I don't know what that looks like to you. I see an old weathered saint that said... No, I'm not giving up at this stage. I believe what I believe and no one's going to cause me to turn back and I'm going to trust God. Dear God, I am Yours. I have walked thus far and I will not turn back. I'm about to break through into the very presence of God. I used to go visit a dying Methodist preacher years ago. His name was Hewlett Aldridge. You never knew him, did you? He was a he was older when I was young. He was already in his seventies and eighties, and he was in a nursing home, and he couldn't move his body. They had to feed him. They had to change him. They had to do everything for him. He was a dying man. But his favorite scripture, I had been told by the family, he couldn't even speak. His favorite scripture was John 14, 1 through 6. And every time I would go to see him, I would visit with him a few minutes, and then I would say, Brother Hewlett, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. 
they weren't on slow. I told you I got to prepare a place for you. And I'm telling you, I don't even get a, a hardly a verse into reading that. And the old man that can't move his body, can't feed himself, can't even speak, begins to pour tears out of his eyes. It's real. Amen. It's real. It's more than black ink on white paper. It is the Word of God. It is more than black ink on white paper. It is the promise of God. He had always knew that. He knew that He was about to step